these notes go with sections 19.1 to 19.3, and they're about logarithms, so logarithmic functions. So remember we found that exponential functions are always increasing. So we know they're one to one, and that means we know they have inverses. So every function that is one to one definitely has an inverse. So the idea is that exponential functions were discovered first and described lots of things that people observed. But then they said, well, look, it's always increasing. So it must have an inverse function. So it got called the logarithmic function. So the inverse function of the exponential function is called the logarithmic function. You'll rarely hear people say the whole word logarithmic. They usually say log. But let me be formal here and then I'll get less formal. So the logarithmic function with a base a, and remember we talked about with the exponent, the base had to be greater than zero and not equal to one. So the base in the exponential function is also the base of the logarithmic function. And we write it as y equals log base a of x. And the of is important. There always has to be something after log. You can't take log of nothing. So it's defined in this way that y equals the log base a of x if and only if a to the power of y equals x. So on the left, we have the logarithmic form. And on the right, we have the exponential form. So these two equations contain exactly the same information. The corresponding letters in the two equations mean exactly the same thing. And often it's easier to think in exponential form, so I'll encourage you to do a lot of switching things from logarithmic form into exponential form where they'll look more familiar. So the domain of the logarithmic function is positive numbers only. And think about that this goes back to that we have the exponential function. And then we know that the inverse function, graph, is a reflection about the line y equals x. So we can see that we get only positive values of x are defined. So that has to be the domain of the logarithmic function, since the range of the exponential function is positive values only. So a logarithm is actually an exponent. If you look at where the y is and where the y is, a logarithm is actually an exponent. So first, let's change exponential statements to logarithmic statements using that definition just for practice. So we see a base with an exponent. So the base, we're going to have log base 4. And the base is a subscript. And then the 16 is what we're taking the log of. And the exponent is the 2. So the log base 4 of 16 is 2 says exactly the same thing as 16 equals 4 squared, just in logarithmic form. And there's lots of reasons to change to logarithmic form, and you just haven't run into them yet, but I promise you will. So for b, we have base of a, log base a, of 2.1 equals 3. So this is the same information written in logarithmic form. And then for C, we have log base 3 of 4.6 equals x. And then D, we have a base of E. So you can write log base E of M equals 2.2. .2, but the base of E, which we talked about in the exponential lessons, we write ln for natural logarithm 
and it means the same thing as the log base E, but it's less writing. So everybody just understands that when you write ln, you mean natural logarithm with a base of E. Okay, so then let's go back the other way. A says that 3 to the negative 2 equals 1 ninth. You can see that that's true. And the next one is b squared equals 4. We're not being asked to solve anything here. We'll just rewrite in exponential form so we don't need to solve. For c, we have 2 to the x equals 6. And then for d, there's the invisible base e that we're not seeing. So e to the 4 equals x. Okay, then let's think about these um, exact values of logarithms without using a calculator. The idea is, think about if this was equal to x. Then let's write it in exponential form. And 8 to the x equals 8. Well, we have an invisible 1 as the exponent here. So we learned in the last set of lessons that that means x equals 1. If the bases are equal, the exponents must be equal. So the log base 8 of 8 is 1. Okay, then the next one, it says if we write it in exponential form, it says 1 third to the power of x equals 9. Well, now it looks like problems we did in the previous lessons, where we can rewrite this with a base of 3. So we have 3 to the negative 1 to the x equals 3 to the 2. And then we multiply exponents and have 3 to the negative x equals 3 to the 2. So negative x equals 2. And that means x must be negative 2. So 1 third to the negative 2 equals 1. Yeah, that makes sense. <coughs> okay, then the next one has a typo, sorry. It should have no base on here. It should just be the log of the cube root of 100. So let's set that equal to an x so we can write it in exponential form as 10 to the x equals the cube root of 100. Well, we can write something with a cube root as having a power of 1 third instead. And now I'm seeing how to write this with a base of 10. So I have 10 to the x is 10 squared to the 1 third. So then I know that 10 to the x equals 10 to the 2 thirds, so x must be 2 thirds. And then let's do d. We have the log base square root of 3 equals 9. So we would have the square root of 3 to the power of x equals 9. And then let's write these both with a base of 3. So we'll have 3 to the 1 half to the x equals 3 squared. So you multiply 3 to the 1 half x equals 3 squared. So now, then I know that the exponents are equal since the bases match. And x must be equal to 1. Okay, so then let's talk about how to find the domain of a logarithmic function. Teachers love this topic, and we'll see why pretty soon, because it lets us test you again on solving inequalities. So let's just remind ourselves if I have a domain of a function, whatever it is, and then I have the range of the function, then the function f is the rule 
it says how to get from some value in the domain to its corresponding value in the range. Well, if that function is one to one, then I also have an inverse function that says how to get from the range of f back to the domain. Well, that means that if I'm starting on the right, that's the domain of f inverse. And the domain of f is the range of f inverse. So the domain and range change jobs. So the domain of the exponential function is all real numbers. And the range is y values greater than 0, which we can write in interval notation as 0 to infinity. So we know that the domain of the logarithmic function is x values greater than 0. And this should say logarithmic. And the range is going to be all real numbers. So if we're being asked to find the domain of the logarithmic function, basically we're being asked to say whatever the argument is, so the argument is what you're taking the logarithm of, must be greater than zero. So see how you're going to be solving inequalities. So let's look at this first example. And I look at the argument of the logarithm, and it's x minus 1. And I write that the condition is that that argument must be greater than 0. And I solve this inequality and say, well, that means x has to be greater than 1. So the domain for this function is x values have to be greater than 1. Okay, and let's look at the next one and say here's the argument, what I'm taking the logarithm of, and the argument has to be greater than zero. Well, this is a rational function, so here's an opportunity for me to test you again and make sure that you remember how to find, uh, how to solve an inequality with a rational function. So you have to find zeros of the numerator and the denominator. In this case, the numerator is never zero, right? One is never zero. But the denominator is zero when x equals five. So x equals five is a zero of the denominator. So that divides my number line into two pieces. Negative infinity to five. 5 to infinity. So those are my intervals. And then I pick a test point. And I decide whether that test point gives me a result that's true or false. So 0 is a convenient test point that's in this interval. If I have 1 over 0 minus 5, that is not greater than zero, so the result of that test is false, and I don't want that piece of the number. So then I can test 10, so 1 over 10 minus 5, that is positive, so I want values of x that are greater than 5, so the domain is x greater than 5, or you can write it to the principal notation, depending on what you have. 5, 2, and 3. Okay, so let's look at C, which is going to be a little more complex. It's solving a rational inequality. X over X minus 1 is greater than 0. So we need the zeros of the numerator. So that's going to be x equals 0. And we need zeros of the denominator. So that's going to be x equals 1. So we're going to have our number line. We're going to have 0 and 1. So 
I'm going to have intervals to negative infinity to 0, 0 to 1, and 1 to infinity. And then we're going to test and figure out whether we're getting true or false. So from negative infinity to 0, I'm going to test negative 10, because that's going to be really obvious. So I have negative 10 over negative 10 minus 1, so negative 10 over negative 11. Yep, that's indeed positive. So I want the number smaller than 0. Then from 0 to 1, let's pick a half, which is any number in that interval. So I'll have a half over a half minus 1. But that's a positive over a negative, so that's not going to be positive, and I don't want those numbers. And then let's pick 10, and I'll have 10 over 10 minus 1, definitely positive. So I want these numbers. Bigger than one. So my domain is going to be negative infinity to 0, union with 1 to infinity. So the numbers between 0 and 1 don't work, but all other numbers work. So I'm going to pause here, just so the movie doesn't get too long, and I'll continue in another picture.